Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, LLC, and These Friends. It's Queens. It's the place that everyone, everyone wants to go to. They want to live there. They want to shop there. They want to stay in hotels. They want to visit. They want to watch baseball. They may want to go see soccer, but it's Queens. So today I've assembled four individuals who know everything about what's happening in Queens. My guests, they include Joseph Matone, who is the chairman and CEO of the Matone Group. Jeremy Shell, who is the senior vice president of development at TF Cornerstone. Joel Bergstein, who is the president at the Lincoln Equities Group, and last but not least, the kid who grew up in Queens, who worked for Queens County Savings, my friend Joe Ficalor, who is the president and CEO of New York Community Bank. So since you are slightly older than me and Mr. Ficalor, what's happening in Queens over your career? Have you seen Queens as vibrant? Well, when I was uh, first introduced to Queens, it was always recognized as the Indians the, were still there uh, as the bedroom of <laughs> Manhattan. I think that uh, description has now uh, come to an eighty, an eighty, a hundred and eighty degree turn, where it stands on its own as both a uh, job-intensive, uh, wonderful place to live, and. Uh, what with the facilities of the uh, subways and buses improving and things of that nature, it's it begun to attract what I think is the uh, uh, sideway movement of money out of Manhattan into various parts of Queens. You know, it's interesting. Prior to the show, we were talking about, because Jeremy's colleagues uh, were on my show many years ago, and I remember saying to, uh, to Tom Alganian, I said, you know, you, you were always in Queens, but you never really loved Long Island City. And it's 13 years, right, or 14 years right. that they started. And, I mean, TF Cornerstone really took the waterfront in Queens, where, you know, it was the Pepsi sign, and now you have, what, seven, eight, nine buildings over there? Yeah, we have seven buildings there. So what, what is the, what's the vision of TF Cornerstone with Queens? Because how many units have you built, and how many units are you planning today? Right. Uh, well, look, Long Island City for us was uh, a big step. We were largely focused on Manhattan until uh, taking on what we call East Coast, which is the, our waterfront master plan community there. We've built over uh, about 3,000 apartments. Uh, we have uh, uh, two large parking garages and a lot of retail that line the street along Center Boulevard. We're planning another 1,200 apartments uh, a little bit further down the street, also on the waterfront in Hunters Point South. Now, you grew up in Queens. I did. You went to Jamaica High School. 
And now, after, I, I mean, did you go back with a permit because you've been spending so much time in New Jersey? Now you're back in Queens, in Hallett's Point. So what is Hallett's Point, you know, for, for my viewers and for the well, other Well, Hallett, Hallett's Point is, um, is the uh, only peninsula, actually, on the Queens waterfront. Um, it's directly opposite Gracie Mansion and Carl Schertz Park. It sits right where uh, Hell's Gate is, and it's where uh, the river and the sound uh, come together. Um, it was uh, 150 years ago. It was actually uh, uh, a, a summer resort for down, downtown Manhattanites, and there were actually plenty of ferries that used to run up there uh, historically. It became an industrial area in, in the early part of the 20th century. And then um, in the 1950s, uh, Robert Moses uh, looked at it and, and uh, uh, put affordable housing on a portion of the peninsula, and the re balance remained industrial. Um, so when we came, came to the site... With, with regard to affordable housing, are we talking about affordable, or are we talking New York City housing? It was New York City Housing Authority. Uh, so uh, Astoria is a very diverse community. There are actually 27 languages spoken in Astoria. Um, and, um, but this was a part of Astoria that was really cut off. Um, and it was but cut what off. do you attribute why it was cut off? I mean, I can understand what happened with Jeremy when we were talking about that section of Long Island City, uh, because it wasn't the, the main section. It wasn't right on the train, you know, but it had great bones, as one would say, the water and everything else. What was, what, what was cut off with Hallett's Point? Most of the, the development in Astoria uh, stopped at Vernon Boulevard, and the only real residential development that, that occurred on Hallett's Point was really the, the uh, New York City Housing Authority site, and the balance of it was commercial. Um, and waterfront uses for, com for, for commercial industrial space uh, haven't been around for you know, nearly 100 years. And so six years ago when we went to the, went to the site and we looked at it, we saw waterfront, not, not unlike what we saw happening in Long Island City. Uh, spectacular views. Um, it was three-quarters of a mile away from, uh, from the subway. It had two bus lines that were there. Um, and it was really um, a, 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 a clean sheet of paper in order to start to uh, look at uh, a development. Now, as you being, and you know, I joke, but it's a fact, I mean, you were born in Queens, you, you, you went to school in Queens, your first job was in Queens. You, I mean, you, you started the Queens County Savings Bank, you know, when you were 16. You know, so you've been in Queens. How have you, and I mean, you're involved with the, the charities and Queens County is a, a big division in New York Community Bank. How do you see the evolution in, in 2014 of Queens today over the last 25 years or so? I think as, as we've been hearing, Queens has gotten to the point where you do not need to take a subway into Manhattan to get a job. There are jobs going east of where you may live, and the views from the Queen side of the river are better than the views from the Manhattan side of the river. <coughs> the reality is that uh, Queens is a better place to live today than many of the other choices in the city as a whole. You know, the entire city is doing better, and people want to be here. But why do you see such a, a preponderance, especially now, as Joel and Jeremy would agree, that this land is selling at highest prices ever for development sites in, in Queens? Why, why is everybody so vibrant on Queens? And you as a bank who's making a major commitment because you've been providing financing, why are you so bullish also on Queens? You know, I, I think it, it, things evolve. There's no question that, that Queens was developed later than Manhattan or Brooklyn. And certainly, Queens had the lesser space. You know, a lot of the factories and whatnot were along the water, and a lot of the factories were throughout the, the borough of Queens. We've gotten to the point now where there is, in fact, ideal locations within the borough to build housing and to build all kinds of business. At the end of the subway is the largest project that's going to be developed. In fact, there are two of them. There's in downtown Flushing, and then there's in Willis Point two of them, and that's at the end of the subway. So people are going to be getting on the train in Manhattan and going into Queens. But, but the interesting thing is if you take even the local to Willis Point or to Flushing, you're still only 25 minutes from Midtown Manhattan. And right. if, it's, if you take the express, it's 15 minutes. I mean, so you, you, know, you look at it in that manner. Accessibility um, 
is, is really remarkable. Again, diversity is very important. Uh, having grown up in Queens, um, what you've seen is the palette really has changed. And so um, clearly a large Asian community, yeah. um, but, but the communities have really evolved. And, and, and what's happened is people work differently today. So uh, when we started looking at our marketing data, we looked and we said, uh, that some, you know, a, a, a good chunk of people will be gravitate towards Manhattan, um, and a fair amount of people will, will go east and go to healthcare facilities out in Long Island. Um, but what we, what, what's been put into place in terms of the Cornell Technoron Center, and the impact that that's having not only in the city, but already having the impact in terms of startups and companies. Uh, it's remarkable to see that, and and then once again we're dealing with companies and young startups that some of them will go to, go to offices, some of them will go to shared workspaces, and others will will work from home. But you know, we, we bring up an interesting. I was talking about Jamaica. You went into Jamaica when? What year would you say? And you, and you brought national chains. Jamaica always had local chains, okay? Yeah. They had Gertz, they had other stores. But you brought, I mean, for whole, uh, Home Depot to make that commitment, the National Amusement to make that commitment, that was a big change for them. It was a big lift, but it was also uh, not unlike uh, Joel's uh, remark about getting the statistical data to support uh, the arguments that you had to make to these chains to en engage them. And also, you had to have a, a, believe it or not, a political administration, which was the Giuliani administration at the time, which was, if you wanted to characterize him as anything, he was pro-business. And he made all kinds of uh, loans available to me because the parking situation at that particular development site required $14 million, which was a horrendous money to allocate to but it had to be done. And uh, the point I'm getting at is that uh, it was a combination of factors that gave rise uh, to uh, the ability to uh, attract in uh, the kind of uh, national tenancy that's there now. Now, but what's also interesting about Queens, you know, uh, and this, you know, if we take the Regal Park, the Kew Gardens section, you have the Queens Center Shopping Center, which has the highest grossing sales per square foot in the country, you know, and people would say, nah, you know, it's, on fifth, it's in Queens Plaza, okay, yes, it's it over is. there. You know, you have those shopping centers over there that have done well over the years, and you know, you had Left Rex City and you know, other situations. Uh, it's a very interesting market. Now, as a developer, and TF Cornerstone has been on the, you know, the cusp in a lot of places besides Long Island City uh, and the west side of Manhattan, do you look at other opportunities in Queens? I think we're in Queens uh, partially because we, we we saw trends. We saw where we thought uh, the city, the direction the city was going in terms of housing. Uh, but but also we saw Queens as an opportunity to, to buy uh, land and uh, development rights uh, at a level that we could afford to produce housing. Um, and when I look at what's happening in all of New York City, but even specifically in Queens, it's hard to go and uh, continue to, to assemble property and build a, a, a rental housing product. Uh, and so absolutely we're interested in expanding our platform, growing in Queens, but it's tougher to find the next emerging market. Now, what's interesting, you know, for my audience is that on, on Joel and your new developments, Hallett's Point and Hunter's Point, one of the biggest problems in New York City is the lack of affordable housing. Absolutely. And each one of these developments is providing very important housing. So tell me about your affordable component, and then Joel will tell me about this. Well, I'll, I'll talk about um, our, the latest site that we were awarded uh, in Hunters Point South, which is down the street from our East Coast Master Plan. It's where I mentioned we were going to build 1,200 apartments. That site is set to be pro provide 60% of the 1,200 apartments as, or 60, 65% as uh, affordable in, in a range of incomes, uh, middle and moderate incomes, ranging from 80 to 165% of AMI. The remaining third would be market rate housing. And Joel, yours? We're 80-20. We're 
We, oh, so you're an 80 20. We're an 80 20. For my audience, that means 20% is affordable. 20% is affordable. We work very closely with the community. We were uh, fortunate enough to, to get a unanimous community board vote, unanimous city, uh, city planning vote, and uh, we had one uh, a no vote at the city council. Um, by working closely with the community, uh, the community understood that new development and the community being, being uh, New York City Housing uh, Authority residents, Astoria Houses, um, that this was going to be good for them because we have a supermarket that's coming to the site, um, uh, service retail, as, as, as we had discussed, uh, that will be there that the community currently doesn't have but actually had when, when, uh, uh, when Astoria Houses was built. And so we're part, part, of our, uh, part of our approvals included a waterfront promenade which connects the greenway along the waterfront um, throughout Queens. Um, there's a terrific resource in Astoria Park, which is literally within walking distance of the site. And most importantly, you have the backdrop of Astoria, which has uh, uh, 27 different languages spoken. Um, and two studios. Two studios. Uh, a yeah. remarkable diversity in terms of, of uh, restaurant offerings, retail offerings, um, some national retailers, but, but a lot of local retailers, um, and at least seven uh, substantial shopping districts. Now, Joe, you, you've been involved, besides the banking community, you've been involved with a lot of the arts and the civic affairs. How do you see those things? I mean, well, the public as, library and so as, as, as just mentioned, the, the Museum of the Moving Image is right there in Astoria. Mm -hmm. And they're doing, they're doing wonderful things. Uh, the New York Hall of Science is also in Queens, mm -hmm. site of the Old World's Fair. Uh, and they draw people from all over the world. You no, know, but you bring out an interesting situation, you know. The, the 1939 World's Fair was in Queens. Okay, yeah. the 64 World's Fair was in Queens. You still have that property, and, and it really hasn't been part of it. hasn't been truly developed. What do you see as a community leader, maybe Joe, also happening in that mar at the old site? Well, I, I think those sites will remain as parks. The the one thing that Queens has is more green than most of the rest of the city, right. and and certainly uh, those parks will continue to be parks. And and it has the terrace. all of well it has terrace on the park, but but it also has uh, museums that are able to attract people and and still enjoy the park. So it has a little zoo and has the the uh, the new Olympic pool. Building. The new Olympic pool that was Claire Shulman put that together. Right. But the, yeah. So. But I mean, it's going to remain essentially a community service dedication. When they attempted to right. try to introduce the issue of a, uh, a cosmos uh, football, um, soccer, 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 soccer. Uh, uh, the um, National uh, League there, the big league, uh, it was really opposed by every element in that community. <laughs> nobody, that, wanted, but, but nobody wanted to carve out all the acreage that was required mm -hmm. from that. For soccer. For soccer. But let's talk about that, because you're working on something which has like 10 acres in Queens and like 400 acres. Well, we're, 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 we're right now, we ant, uh, answered, and you know how long it took with you at Hallett's Cove? Six. And Six years. You, A couple you years. You probably were a little younger when you started, <laughs> right? But my point was that we're at, uh, we answered about uh, in uh, November of uh, 13. Uh, this now over uh, a year and two months. Uh, we were one of three respondents uh, to the development of the Belmont. Uh, and uh, the, go the governor, uh, the people, the Empire State Development had asked for proposals. And they gave you certain defined lines. They didn't want housing, and, uh, and, you know, and uh, they didn't want more big box fuses. So we had to find something that we thought might be able to afford the, uh, you know, within those parameters, a, uh, um, a use. And uh, we uh, developed a, uh, a, an arrangement with the Cosmos, which is the old Pele group, as you may remember, and uh, we discovered after doing a lot of research how many uh, soccer <laughs> alumni there are in Nassau and every kid in Suffolk and, and parts you, of Queens. And as you said before the show, you know, with what's happening with football, with the injuries, you know, soccer has much less injuries than... Absolutely. Than There's very, very no, no comparison, even though they hit 
the ball with their head occasionally. That's yeah, a lot that's, less than right. getting hit, you know, the way they're getting hit. But, so your plans over there are for a Cosmo? Yeah, about a... Uh, uh, and, and a hotel, I think you told me. Yeah, and then a, a series of a retail a supermarket and a, some some community centers uh, for historical you, you know, uh, stuff. We're talking about all the great positives of Queens, but unfortunately there is a section of Queens which people don't talk about. As I would say, and certain people would remember, it was a two-fair zone. It was called the Rockaways. Now, the Rockaways are still in Queens, you know, and you, you're a bank, and you've been looking at it. Why hasn't the Rockaways really resounded or, or done well in Queens? Well, it, it was developed in, in, in a way that doesn't lend itself well to bringing business into the, that. It's, it's separated from the rest of Queens, and, and it's not readily reachable. Right, as I would say, the right. two fairs. Well, I, I think I think one of the important things there, and, and actually there's development that's taking place. The Conic has a project that's there, yeah. and, and, and a very important thing. I mean, when you look back again historically, some of the stuff that we did um, is, is ferry service. I mean, ferry service would play oh. real, substantial ferry service um, to the Rockaways would have a really positive impact okay, on, on uh, uh, further development in Rockaway. Because when you look at it from a resource, I mean, we're looking at <coughs> being close to Manhattan and looking at waterfront. But Rockaway is a real waterfront. Yeah, all and around. And so, so it's all around. So now, do, do you have uh, water uh, ferries? Water ferry. Uh, there's a water ferry landing uh, that far right away. across from the, our new site at Hunters Point South. So it's not far from our East Coast manager plan. But no, most our tenants occasionally use that waterfront, uh, the water taxi, that is. It's, I think it's not as frequent uh, as it's needed. Okay. It's not as proximate uh, yet. Um, and, it's, and Hunters Point South is still developing. So most of our tenants, if they're commuting into Manhattan, are, are using the number seven line. See, but something which is lacking in the Long Island City market, and also a little bit in Astoria, and Joe and I have discussed it, is that there's, New York City in general is under-retailed, but we're also under-retailed where, where your developments are and where your develop. okay? Different type of retail. You have more community. Astoria has more of a community mm -hmm. development. But Long Island City, you know, Vernon Boulevard, you know, th there are things, but I think you need more. Look, I think we need more, and, and I think w as the neighborhood gets built out, residential will bring in retail, and there's no doubt retail follows. It has in all of the emerging markets that we've built in, but but Vernon Boulevard is, is thriving, and Center Boulevard, what we've put in, we've put in, we have now four restaurants along Center Boulevard, Kids Daycare, New York Kids Club, a, a coffee shops, wine bars, so I, I think the local retail's there, the amenity retail's there, we have supermarkets, drugstores, but I agree that it will get you know further built out, especially as the density. Uh, Assemblages are hard. Uh, you know, when you look at um, properties along along the waterfront, and some of this has to do with master plan and zoning. Um, you know, you mentioned Queen Center; it's a vertical mall, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure, as Joel will say, you know, most of the retailers look and say, "No, you can't do vertical malls. So who's going to park in decks?" And they park in decks. Um, and, and so. Um, the question really is, is how much big box retail do you need in order to serve the community? Um, one of the things that we did, again, just looking at number of cars, I mean, early on in the development of Long Island City, parking was really a secondary uh, 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 con uh, consideration because, because of the subway that's there. But people who move to Queens move for the following reasons, because you asked the question earlier on, then I'll answer, is <coughs> you have high prices in New York, the Brooklyn waterfront and most parts of Brooklyn now uh, are really approaching New York prices. So your alternatives in seeking um, rents which are more affordable um, are either in Queens or going to Jersey City in order to be close if you're working in Manhattan. Um, and and from a, uh, for a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll use Zipcar or the Hertz car sharing service. Um, and not necessarily own a car. So we see a changing demographic in, in the current generation that's coming in. I, I think bringing up the, the, the zip car and the Hertz sharing and the bicycles is really changing the, w the way people, because you don't really need a car. I, I mean, you don't I, need to I, own I a car. You don't have to own a car, and you have the convenience of renting it for X number of hours and all the other situations. My only problem is one, I worry about some of the bikers not looking 
when they're we're writing and also half the people texting when they're right. doing that. Now you're also building some new things in Queens. You know? Well, uh, opposite the El the uh, Elmhurst uh, shopping mall, uh, we're putting up three new restaurants. Uh, we're putting up a uh, gar Olive Garden, uh, a Longhorn uh, Steakhouse, uh, and Joe's Crab, and Joe's Crab, and uh, we found that. Uh, by uh, doing a kind of a mixed deal where we uh, we did the in infrastructure, the foundations, in order because uh, we could expedite them and build them a lot cheaper, to be candid with you. Now, now what's also interesting, you know, on the Vornado spite, you know, where the Alexanders was, yeah, yeah. you know, where they put the Home Depot and the Costco, now, you know, and they had said it, they're going to be putting up apartments over there because of the the convenience on uh, that situation. And Flushing, which you've been involved with, I mean, what's happening in the Flushing market? Today? Well, there's no question that it's being developed. The the downtown Flushing project is going to be one of the larger projects. Right, the built. TD development, yeah, right? Yeah, And then uh, you have, you know, IU Willits, which is also huge. But I think what you touched upon earlier, there is no city that has so much waterfront as New York City. Absolutely. It's, it's surrounded by water, borough by borough. If we would utilize should we call it Venice? Ferries, should we call it Venice? It's almost. It's, it's close. <laughs> but but that would be a huge improvement in getting around town. But that's one thing. But I think also perhaps in certain parts of Queens and in also I brought this up when I did a show in Brooklyn that if you had this in like Coney Island, I think if you had which they do have in New Jersey, you know, in Jersey City, the the light rail. Light rail. If you had yeah. a light rail, Agreed. okay. M moving people, the light rail could really be very valuable well, in, in, to help in some of the distance. Communities. Distance is an issue with light rail. Uh, we have a site in Jersey City that has a light rail station. We're going to build a light rail station. Um, but I think Queens is a very good example of having the opportunity to introduce light rail. You know, capital cost is substantially less, obviously, than, 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 uh, than a subway, and we're learning that from the Second Avenue subway. Back to the point is, is there are lots of communities that are on the water. Uh, we recognize that ferry service needs to be subsidized, but the more fre the, the frequency is driven by demand and cost is driven down well, by and, and you know, you bring up, there's a very interesting thing. We're talking about the subways and everything, and let, let's be realistic. Uh, the seven line, which is one of the quickest ways into Manhattan, is within you know nine months is going to be extended to 34th Street and 11th Avenue, yep. which is going to be opening up an entire new city. Okay, you know the Hudson Yards and and all the periphery like around. Like New Jersey, also. so so you know, <laughs> you know, you, you know, it's really bringing a lot of interesting. We are a region. I think that when you look at this regionally, you look, you know, everybody was focused on Manhattan and all the opportunity in Manhattan. And then the rezoning of, of the Brooklyn waterfront. And then all of a sudden it kind of, uh, then what happened was was um, uh, uh, the Barclay Center developed, which is spurned development, you know, uh, in all around the center that nobody was thinking about. Who would have thought that Flatbush Avenue uh, would, would have become what it is today? I mean, but you know what? I, I think what Joe said before I s is, you know, when you've had, you know, let's say 20 years of great administration who have been pro-business, who have been trying to expand because our growth is important, you know, they've helped. You know, you have to thank the Giuliani and the, uh, the Bloomberg administration for being visionaries and a lot of changes. Uh, let's hope that the uh, de Blasio administration continues with this. And uh, you know what? When I invite you back in six months to talk about Queens, I know there'll be much more to happen. And I'd, li I'd like to thank my friend Joe Matone. Thank you for having us. You? Okay. I appreciate Jeremy it. Jeremy Schell, uh, Joel Bergstein, and Joe Ficalora. And I'll see you next week. Yeah.